Hello and welcome to Kicking Tires. My name is Jimmy. And I'm Justin. Today we got not not that much news today, but we got some exciting stuff. So let's talk about the first thing here. It's a brand new Volkswagen Beetle. The, the classic Very, Beetle. Yeah, classic. <laughs> uh, old school. Um, GD3 Touring Package, new for 2022. Uh, all this basically is is the kind of like a more street oriented version of the GT3. And GT3 being a track special, you know that's the one that you see in every every track day. There's a bunch, uh, and you know the big difference: no fixed wing, right? So GT3 nowadays gets a pretty substantial wing, like not even just the RS, but the normal GT3 model gets a pretty substantial wing. And so the Turing model doesn't have any visible wing. It does have a little spoiler that comes up at speed, just like Porsche has done for many years now. And it has a pretty similar uh, body kit compared to the GT3. It's just that it's more body colored versus the uh, black kind of unpainted look of a GT3, which is a little bit more raw. This is a bit more polished. Speaking of polish, you get silver, I think it looks like a brushed silver uh, window frame. So it's a little bit more luxury oriented, I guess you could say. Um, classy. So, classy. So like the um, outgoing GD3 Touring, so the 991 generation, um, this is going to be available with the manual. So that was kind of what was special about the Touring model, you know, along with the 911R was that they were the manual versions of the hardcore track cars. The hardcore track car, you want the PDK. The cars is so fast that a manual kind of doesn't work anymore. Um, but in the in the Touring trim and the R trim, they were six speed manuals. So that's a little bit different from the uh, normal Carreras and GTS is where you could get a seven speed mm -hmm. manual transmission. The six speed is actually the more motorsports oriented gearbox. The seven speed is more of the street gearbox, like the PDK uh, converted into a manual, kind of like BMW did with their SMG and manual back in the day. Um, so the seven speed is, I guess, more comfort oriented and the shifter is not quite as aggressive this is the gt sports gearbox so it does have the more aggressive transmission uh, and then just like the g3 you got the wide body that high revving four liter flat six and that double wishbone or double a arm unique front suspension that you get on gt3 makes the steering that great uh interior gets a few unique differences here and there as far as the trim goes you can still get it with the uh the bucket seats, like the fixed buckets, which they show in the pictures on their press release with the carbon. Um, but yeah, the manual transmission, that's not the only offering for the Touring. And I wonder if that has anything to do with our other news piece this week, which is the California regulations regarding the GT3. Yeah, because in California, you can't get a manual GT3 because of noise restrictions. It's too loud. So I'm thinking if it's going to be the same for the Touring or if it has like a different tuned exhaust. Hard to say. We don't have that information right now, but we can kind of assume that it should be very similar. Um, that's why the PDK is a, an availability for those people that live in California. Well, yeah, it's available everywhere, but what happened is if you ordered a GT3 manual, you now get to choose the, the PDK one, mm. uh, and they'll switch you over to the PDK at no charge. Like I don't know if there's no charge, because the PDK usually is, is an optional extra, but I wonder... You know, I heard some rumor that it's because of the testing. So what's, what happened is that they decided the manual is too loud, and the, the PDK just passes the uh, noise restriction, I guess. And I think it might be the testing. Um, someone told me that, oh, maybe it's because when you're when you're testing an automatic, you just leave it in drive, and then it just upshifts its way up. Whereas with a manual transmission, you might need to be at a specific RPM or specific gear. Oh. Um, and that would kind of skew the results a little bit, even though they technically have the same engine and 
exhaust, it may sound different. So just like if you were to uh, leave an M4 or a Supra in just drive versus doing it manual mode, they they will sound different just because of how uh, how high it, it typically revs up. Um, because normally in a comfort setting, there's no reason to exceed you know 2,000 RPM in a car like this. No, that makes sense. Can we just talk about how it looks real quick here? The the front end, I mean, we talked about this a little bit before the show started. I know you said you're not a big fan of the front end, but I can't stop staring at the back. The back, it's really elegant without that wing on the back. Yeah, it's really classy. Like the grill that they put on the uh, rear there, I think it reminds me a little bit of those singers. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's a classy look and the front... The front, even though I don't like it that much, I think it is nicer than the GT3. I think in a lighter color, it's a little bit too busy um, because there's the, the nose scoops on the hood. I kind of feel like they should have like filled that in. Yeah, yeah. I'm they sure could have kept this cooling. bumper. Yeah. There's more but... radiators probably on the GT3, so that's probably why they have to keep that mechanically yeah, there if it was just a, f a flush hood i think it'll just make the front end more yeah touring -esque. and we we mentioned this when we first uh talked about the gt3 was that if you look at outgoing models the gt3 had a really elegant little hood crease scoop right. whereas this generation they just like you know what Screw it. we're just gonna make it <laughs> nostrils like we do on our race cars uh that it's proven it works it's better and it just, especially from the top down, it just doesn't look great. Um, yeah, 997 had a super nice one. 996 was super nice. And then, yeah, they just, with the yeah. two separate nostrils, it doesn't work with the front end design. That's very curvy. The car is so curvy and you just have two straight slits running down the hood. It just, <laughs> I just don't think it works. But I think, I think function they over form. I think they could have put a little bit more R&D on it to suit make it so that at least there's no scoops on the touring model yeah. I, I get it on the regular gt3 you're gonna take that to the track you need that cooling but i feel like they could have done something a little different on yeah, just uh, on the touring model smooth it out a little bit like as far yeah. as like just the corners just smooth it out a little bit like this is the worst you know all these um supercars and track specials have some kind of venting going on on the hood but look at like mclaren's right it's all integrated like it matches the headlight the curves with the fenders everything works and this is just a little bit you know whatever they just took an axe and sliced two holes into the hood <laughs> they yeah. just kind of just did it for the purpose of doing it it, it looks it definitely yeah. looks off um um but like you yeah. said, it is the exact same front end on the GT3 versus the Touring. The only difference mm -hmm. is it's painted. Yeah, I wonder if they will do the R variant, uh, which if I remember the, the previous R variant had two stripes going down and right. it kind of lined up with the grills in the back and it kind of right. completes that. It's not the most elegant look, <laughs> but um, I'm curious if they will do a 992R. I think they will. Uh, the biggest reason I think it will do the R again and offer the manual with the R again, I think, is to kind of quell that a lot of that speculative marketing that people do with, with their 911, with their GT cars, because a lot of people try to hype these cars up and say, oh, they're the last, this is the last manual. This is the last manual steering or, or not manual, hydraulic steering. This is the last mm. of the, of the, uh, last of the 3.8, last of the air cool. It's leader. always last of whatever, last of whatever. And I think Porsche got kind of fed up with that. And that's probably why they brought back the manual transmission. They're like, I don't think it's because, oh, there's driving purists that just, because they don't really care uh you know if you're if you're some driving purist that's not gonna buy it well we have a buyer lined up for the pdk they have no hard time selling these cars no matter no. how they fit them but i think they want people to get out there and drive it and to be fair every track day i go to there's a lot of porsches mm. and and people do really drive them 
some of them not as fast as others, but that's fine. You know, I all respect to you if you're if you're taking your car out and and using it for its intended yeah. purpose. At least you're but enjoying I think, it. Yeah, and I but I think Porsche is annoyed that when you see a five year old car that has two thousand kilometers on a clock trying to sell for three times its MSRP, that's what's annoying. This is like that car did not get to live its life to its full potential and will not live its life to its full potential. Because if you're buying this car at triple the MSRP, guess what? You're not going to be tracking it because that is now a museum piece. You're going to sit on that. That's just going to be for cars and coffee, cars and coffee. Um, and it's just... Where you yeah, can talk about what? About resale value, depreciation, <laughs> and... Uh, overall cost of ownership with a 911 because that's what a lot of that's how i would say 50 percent of porsche club conversations start <laughs> uh, yeah it's just like we don't talk about what we've done to our cars what we where we've gone with our cars uh what tracks we plan on visiting it's like oh, I bought this car because it was a great investment. You know, I got to meet a lot of people and it was networking. And it's just like, this is not what Porsche was about 20 years ago. And yeah, it used to be a more grassroots group. I, I was kind of immersed in it as a kid growing up, seeing Porsche Club and then Porsche Club now. It is just cars and coffee every every weekend <laughs> in the summer. And it's just like, I don't know. Like I, I want, I want these cars. I just don't know if I want to be associated with them and the people <laughs> type of people that buy them. Um, well, well, maybe yeah. later on you can buy your own Porsche and then start your own club, the anti yeah. cars and coffee club. Anti car. I should make that like a a, a sweatshirt and <laughs> like instead of anti social social club. It's anti cars and coffee, <laughs> cars and coffee cars club, because it track you know it only. makes sense not just track days only, but like <laughs> I I I don't like the cars and coffee culture as much, but I think the worst is like rally culture, rally like the kind mm. of rally that would make you know <laughs> Colin McRae roll around in his grave, that kind of rally <laughs> where you just. You're just driving on a highway, speeding, pissing off all the Karens, and then complaining, ah, these Karens are calling the cops on us. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like that is that is a rally these days. Yeah, <laughs> What's left of it, in Canada there, at least. <laughs> there, there actually was a few of them recently, and I was like, huh, this is what it's about now, I guess. It's just stunting on the street and, and pissing off and, uh, you know, doing what do they call those takeovers oh, takeovers yeah. <laughs> yeah like that's that's car culture i mean it is kind of comes with the territory but uh unfortunately that i think that is kind of how we fall in <laughs> in terms of car culture and and there's our first rant of the day thanks justin yeah that's <laughs> quality rant <laughs> Uh, let's move on from Porsche to something a little bit more reliable. Actually, and you know what? Porsches are pretty reliable. Let's let's move on to something that's a little bit more available to the rest of us. Let's say that. Mm, super relevant uh, car. This this is the NX. So the NX is a uh, Lexus kind of middle child, right? You have the UX, which is the little tiny one. You have the NX, which is slightly bigger. And then you have the RX, which is kind of like the midsize. The Lexus RX is... Um, Lexus is bread and butter. They sell the most RX out of all their cars. NX is a close second, but with this iteration, they're hoping that it will be a little bit more popular because this size of the NX, it's just right to compete yeah. it against like the Audi Q3, the BMW X1, uh, Mercedes like GLA, GLB kind of thing. Because this not only is it a good looking vehicle because i think it's actually pretty striking you actually get four powertrain choices that's the biggest that's part of huge it. for for a company like lexus the fact that you're not only well you're not even getting the uh the the 2gr anymore like <laughs> like that is that is mind-blowing to me that oh we're finally not getting the 2gr which i mean to be fair the uh old nx kind of figure that it. one out too yeah but um to get new engines that is that is like 
a game changer from from Toyota and Lexus because it just rarely happens. It, it it happens less, you know, once in a blue moon. You'll you'll see more, I don't know, global phenomena than than Toy- new new Toyota Lexus engines. <laughs> so let's talk about the powertrains. Uh, the first engine, the base engine, is going to be the NX two hundred and fifty, which is a two and a half liter four cylinder, two hundred and three horsepower. So think regular RAV4 because the NX is basically a RAV4 base. There's mm-hmm. okay. Don't get angry yet. There's a lot of R and D. There's a lot of stuff that makes this an Lexus and not a Toyota. So yeah. there's a whole lot of sound ending that's going to be in here. There's going to be tons of better quality materials that's in here compared to the Toyota. So while yes, it has the same powertrain, it's going to drive different. Um, then stepping up from the NX 250, you got the NX350. The 350 uses a brand new 2.4 liter turbo. It has 275 horsepower and it uses an eight speed automatic to put that power to the ground. That's actually quite important because there's not a lot of vehicles in that segment that has um, that a little bit more powerful engine. I mean, yes, you have the GLA, um, which you can get the 35 and the 45, mm. but the X1, you can't get it with the more powerful motor that you get in like the Countryman. And the mm. Q3, there is going to be an SQ3 coming in later, but you know, that's going to be slightly different, right? That's not like, I feel like the NX350 is a little bit more powerful where yeah. it's going to be more luxury powerful. Rather than at the same powerful. time, I think the NX is kind of in a middle ground between the X1 and X3, or like the, the Q3 and the Q5. Yeah, it's not really. It it competes a little bit above the X1 segment. I want to say it's um, a little bit bigger than it. Yeah. Yeah, and then the RX is even though it's price similar to the X3, it's it's big. Like the RX is quite a bit bigger than those. It's that's true. Yeah, that's true. Like the um, back seat room is, is not comparable, I would say. Yeah. From the NX350, there's the NX350H. So think RAV4 hybrid because it's a two and a half liter turbo. Sorry, just a two and a half liter, no turbo, uh, <laughs> two electrical motors, 239 horsepower. But the one that you would probably want to get, the one that's most exciting. But you probably won't be able to get one because it's going to be like <laughs> very limited supply. It's the NX 450H. It's the same two and a half liter hybrid with two motors, but more powerful motors. That's going to be 302 horsepower. This is a plug in hybrid with 36 miles of electrical range or 58 kilometers. So think RAV4 Prime and Prime Lexus. It's just going to be a more luxurious experience on the RAV4 Prime. And that's really what it is. You get the RAV4 kind of side to it because the RAV4 is a really good vehicle. I mean, you own one, you know how good it is. But the RAV4, when you step inside it, I'm sure you can admit there's some pieces of those plastics and just the overall yeah. like switch here. It just doesn't have that quality feel to it. Yep. Lexus, it's, it's probably market. It's it's trails behind a lot of its competitors, I think, because Toyota has the NX to lean back on. If you want yeah. a more premium experience, and just looking, I've I've seen some of the videos of the NX in action, and it's like just the way you open the door and just like all your touch points, everything just feels so much nicer. All the buttons is just a step above. I think even if you go with a base model, you're still getting better um feel out of it than even a top of the line RAV4, which would be pretty similarly priced if you think about it. Yeah. Um, Pricing hasn't yeah. been announced just yet for the NX, but it should be a little bit more than what it is today. But if we look at the current price comparing to the top range RAV4, it's really close. Yeah. Speaking of styling, I, I don't know if I'm that in love with it. I think it's a little bit they went they they took it easy on this one like it's just a too conservative i, I think it is yeah, for they the didn't take end. any risks with this car like it's it's nice but it's not it doesn't excite me and it doesn't it doesn't seem like as much of a departure from the last one like look at 
the 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 2017 RAV4 versus the 2019. Like it's a it's a big departure styling wise, and just um, just the way the lines are, um, the overall greenhouse. But this, I think, if you were to cover you know the front and back with your hand, you couldn't really tell you know from the side view that this is a new model yeah um, it it definitely looks like the current one a little too much um what i'm currently looking at right now is the nx 350h and that front grill i can't it needs the f sport front grill this front that grill front grill looks like an escalator <laughs> <laughs> it, does. it does it looks like the steps off the escalator they're I'm not a fan of this grill at all. Yeah. Um, the spindle grill, like I've come to to actually kind of like the spindle grill over the mm -hmm. years because, you know, the when we first saw the spindle grill, it's kind of like, oh my gosh, it looks like Bane's mask, right? Like it yeah. just doesn't look Alien right. Alien versus Predator. <laughs> but I mean, looking at it now, I'm like, okay, I'm I'm okay with it, but yeah. only with the F Sport. I think I like the F Sport one a lot more. Um, but the inside, I think that's where you're going to have a lot of those Lexus touch points that we talked about. Um, in this picture, when we're looking at the inside, we're looking at the infotainment. This is the base 9.8 inch infotainment screen, which is a relatively wide unit for the mm. dash, right? Because the RAV4, you get an 8 inch as the biggest, and that really already takes up most of the dash. But this at a 9.8 inch, it's actually quite large. But there's an optional 14-inch display. <laughs> the 14-inch yeah. display literally takes the entire dash. It goes past the uh, bezels and it, it eats into the, the knobs uh, in a good way. I mean, I'm not going to uh, crap on it because I think it was the u user interface looks like it's been upgraded a lot. Um, yes. It looks yes. a lot more user friendly than the outgoing Lexus interface, and the biggest thing to me, interior wise, like this interior is unlike the X series. This interior is a whole transformation. Like this is a whole new car, and it just feels nothing like the old one in a great way. Mm -hmm. um, where <laughs> I want to point the finger a little bit is look at the IS and how little they did. They did virtually nothing to that interior. They transformed the exterior quite a bit. This makes more sense is to update the I interior. I think you're being too nice on the IS interior. I really don't think they changed a single thing. They added gloss black trim down the middle. They gave you red lowers as an option. Yeah, um, that's, this, that's nothing. This <laughs> Lexus is capable of doing a whole new interior. And with the IS, what they decided was that the eight-year-old one that wasn't even revolutionary then we're going to keep it whereas the the nx they they took a risk here and i think it will pay off it, i think, I think the it will is pay off. yeah but, i think with the is it's just people who want the is will buy the is yeah. but no one is going to be swayed by that interior so the um, is is uh it's not a volume seller for lexus exactly i don't think they care enough to put that much effort into it and you can tell with the new F Sport variant, the the five liter V8, they didn't even make it as good as the a next generation ISF. They could have, but they didn't bother because it's a low volume seller. This is something that they're going to make their money on. Um, the picture I'm looking at right now is actually the door handle. Something that's mm. actually really cool. I don't know if you saw this in their videos, but every single door, it's an electronic release inside mm. as well as out now. It's kind of cool but like different like, yeah but is it needed cool. I, don't, I don't know it is uh, a little bit more elegant especially when you're opening the door you don't get that snap back the back, back every time you let go sorry uh, what sound, <laughs> back, back sound. <laughs> <laughs> and the uh <laughs> and the inside handle so when you press it that's a release similar to um like a tesla yeah um but, but if you if need the, the battery manual dies release. It's right there too, which I think is really clever. Yeah, so you press it down for the electronic release, but the manual release is just pulling that as a lever. It's mm -hmm. super clever using that exact same switch as two different points. So you don't have like a button and then a latch somewhere else. Because like the Corvette like, C5. Like, yeah, like the old Corvettes. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> what I kind of like is the electronic latches on the outside as well. So there's a little button on the outside that you can press on to do that. And there's also a manual latch on the outside as well. Um, but I think it's neat. Like it's a cool idea. I mean, it's a, you know, going to be life-changing. I, I don't, not at all. Um, I don't think so, but it's cool. You know, yeah. it's coming up with something that's a little bit more innovative than just sticking with the, the norm essentially. Yeah. And they've, I think they've gone up market with the NX a little bit. So I, I do expect pricing to be slightly higher than the outgoing one. The yeah. reason why is because of the UX, they kind of have to make some room there. Right. Um, compared to before, the IS kind of had a nicer interior than the NX. If we look back at 2015, the, the, the NX in 2015 did feel a little bit like a tarted up uh, RAV4. But the uh, IS was, it's kind of its own thing. But I think they've kind of switched that around as well now uh, with the NX and the IS. So um, I really like what they've done. Yeah, it's, it's just curves. There's just more going on and it doesn't look cheap and it doesn't resemble the RAV4, which is, which I think is, that's which a is win. Huge. Which is huge, yeah. yeah. Nothing um, against the RAV4, obviously. It's, it's one of the best-selling cars. Yeah. Yeah. But, but you don't want to be paying this kind of money for Rough Orange. Exactly. You don't want to be falling into the same trap as some Infinity or Acura models, where <laughs> it just does not feel like a big enough departure from the non premium variant, quote unquote so, non premium. Here's the thing um, as you know, Toyota came up with the premium Rough Four already, which is called the Venza. Uh, or the Harrier in other markets. Mm. The Venza, when I drove it, I thought it was okay. In the pictures before I drove it, I was like, "Oh, this is this is exactly what I'm looking for." The <laughs> Raw Four is just a little bit, just a little bit too, too utilitarian. Yeah, yeah, I wanted something a little bit more. But when I got into the Venza, I gotta be honest, I wasn't that impressed with it because yeah. the materials, yes, is better, but it wasn't great. Lower downs, all the touch points were still kind of meh. Yeah. With this, why is the Venza still there? Yeah, this is more revolutionary. This is, you know, it's kind of like domestic brand luxury back in a day where you had your, your Buick model, your, your Chevy model, and then the Venza is kind of just like the Chevy or the Buick No, the model. GMC. Yeah, it's the GMC. Like, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a little bit better, but you can absolutely tell that this is just a rebadge <laughs> pontiac or chevrolet yeah uh, yeah whereas this is just tr transformed yeah um, no, this wouldn't be a buick this is more, more like cadillac it's this is yeah more. this is a cadillac for yeah, sure this is a little bit more <laughs> um what was i gonna say the i like what they've done here because um the if you get into the X1s or the, the GLAs, those cars do, especially the Q3. Okay, the Q3 looks great, but then it, like, inside, I think everything looks good, but damn, does that car feel like a Jetta? Mm. Like, I, I don't know. I think I don't get, maybe because the X1 feels like a Mini, and the Mini doesn't feel bad to me, mm. but the Jetta kind of feels kind of crappy to me yeah. that the Q3 reminds me a little bit too much of the Jetta in a way that even I think the Golf feels better than the Q3. <laughs> and that's, that's uh, that you don't want to get stuck in that situation. Right. Uh, Mercedes doesn't have anything to compare it to, but I think BMW, uh, the X1 definitely doesn't feel as nice as this. It mm -hmm. doesn't look as premium. Well, it doesn't look as nice, but of course we won't be able to tell until we get our hands on one and actually start to touch yeah. the insides and feel it all up and whatnot. Yeah. Um, because what it looks in pictures is going to be very different than what it is in real life. Um, you know, going back to the Venza, it looked amazing in photos. It really did. Mm -hmm. I I was like, this is my next car. I drove it. I <laughs> sat in it. I was like, this is not it <laughs> it's so, so, yeah it's like do i really want to be paying an extra i don't know four or five grand for different colors and bigger infotainment system that 
really doesn't work that doesn't much work better. As and, well. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. There, there was just a lot of disappointing things with the vents, uh, to be very honest. It looks so nice from the outside, though, but it just, it wasn't enough for me. Yeah. This, I think, this is your step up. Like, it, it, it just makes so much sense. Like, if you want to be utilitarian, you get the RAV4, and then if you want the luxury, you get the NX, and it just, yeah. it, it keeps it within the family, because I remember we were talking about this last week with Hyundai, uh, you know, you even if you appreciate the heck out of your what is the the midsize SUV, <laughs> the Santa Fe, Santa Fe, you you don't necessarily step up to the Genesis, I think, um, or or the Kia. You don't you don't go from the Kia to the Genesis. I think they didn't draw that line. Mm-hmm. Whereas this is like, look at our mechanical greatness the engineering the hybrid system the reliability the resale value all that great stuff that you're getting with our cheaper brand you're getting that plus more and it's just a very logical you know okay i'm doing better now i'm gonna step up from the rav4 to the nx i think i think there is more of a lineage there that Mm -hmm. other brands are not able to capitalize on quite as well I think the next topic, Audi, I think they do a decent job at that. Yes, they've upgraded this car quite a bit. <laughs> yeah. So for 2022, Audi has released a brand new, or updated, actually, no, it's brand new, the brand new A3 as well mm-hmm. as the S3. And I think, you know, if we're talking about lineage, if we're, you know, upgrading from a vehicle, like the people that had a Golf, you know, if they want a better interior, this is what they're looking into the a3 or the s3 and for 2022 like it's not a far departure from what it was before um to be honest it looks very very similar but it's been that way forever right all audis always look the same as the past ones Mm -hmm. but the uh the s3 the really aggressive front bumper it looks pretty good you got matrix head uh led headlights you got a mild hybrid system now with the a3 And you get a little bit more power in the S3. Like, there's a lot of good things here about this brand new Audi. This little Audi. Yeah, I like what they've done with the styling is to make it look really little. Like, seeing a little Audi, like, somehow this car looks like it's shrunk. (laughs) I think the old one, they tried to stretch it out, make it look more mature. But then they realized, you know what? That's what the A4 is for. Yeah, We're going to... and. And props to Audi because uh, no one is really doing sedans or this small sedan uh, like them. I think they 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 were kind of smart. They kind of did what the NX did, which is keep the exterior familiar. You know, if you like the old S3 and A3, you'll still like this one. Yeah. Um, and but the interior is just transformed. Yeah, the interior is where you get the mo- the biggest upgrades. Um, mm-hmm. It's very similar to the Gen 8 Golf. Uh, you get that shaver-looking thing for a shifter, which is really different. <laughs> um, but it looks like you get a whole bunch of gloss black plastics in the center as well, which personally not a big fan of, but I'm sure a little bit of wrap is you know not a big problem. Um, the base engine is a 2-liter turbo. It makes 201 horsepower, 221 pound-feet of torque, com- uh, made it to a seven speed dual clutch. You can get that front wheel drive or for an, I think it's like $2,000 more. You can get it with the Quattro. Uh, that all comes with the, the mild hybrid system, which should help you um, to save a little bit of fuel uh, for those city runs. It's not um, a full on hybrid. It's just a mild hybrid. So it helps you power like your electronics that's in the car, the air conditioning. So it doesn't actually have to run off the engine as much. So it can, coast essentially on electrical Mm -hmm. power yeah i think it helps you like stop and go stop and go should be a lot smoother with any mild hybrid as well yeah yeah i've never really driven it or i've driven cars that i didn't know were mild hybrids so it's kind of kind of weird it's it's very subtle i think well there's some companies that do it well and there's some that really don't um i remember driving the the new evoke which had a which had the the mild hybrid and that was not a very good mount hybrid system. It was very rough. Right. But the uh, S3, let's talk about that for a second. Um, where it is? There it is. S3 looks good. So 
It has a little bit more power than before. 306 horsepower, 295 pound-feet of torque, same two-liter uh, four-banger. There's going to be an RS3, and the rumors suggest that it's still going to be a five-cylinder turbo, which is going to be awesome and sounds amazing. Um, but the S3, you're looking at zero to 60 times in about four and a half seconds. That's that's pretty good for yeah. a car for, for this size. And it's not like super expensive. 45000 um, US for the S3 is it's susceptible. And that's the base model, of course. You can, you know, get more stuff with it and you're looking at like 55 or something like that hmm. yeah it's a good little like for people still looking for a little sedan or quote unquote pseudo luxury sedan i guess it still makes two sense. or three people <laughs> yeah i i don't know how big this market is and you know i'm i've always been a golf art guy myself like i definitely prefer the hatchback um well, and even had they had the S3 hatchback, I might lean towards the Gulf. They're, they're making it, just not for us. Yeah, just <laughs> we don't get it here in Canada. Um, but yeah, I don't know who still buys these, but nice. <laughs> not a bad attempt for, for a car that not too many people buy. And you know what's funny? I think because of the transverse layout, this car, backseat-wise, is is pretty much just as good as the is and mm. i think those two cars if you compare them side by side it's like practicality like dollar wise they're 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 quite close um and although the is is much bigger outside i don't find it to be much bigger inside just because of the layout the front front drive base layout that you get right. on the uh the a3 and s3 and it's just so much more engaging to drive <laughs> yes I don't know. <laughs> to me, to me, that's why Lexus could have done better. <laughs> it always comes down to Lexus could have done better. Mm, no, the NX was great. <laughs> the NX was covered. <laughs> yeah, but the IS, uh, I will not. I don't know when I will stop uh, ragging on that car. Probably till they till they discontinue it, which is probably <laughs> soon. It's a Lexus. It probably won't discontinue it for a very long time. Let's be honest. <laughs> yeah when has alexis died uh let's move on to the the final thing here which is the review of the 2021 toyota supra um i got a chance to drive this um toyota canada was like hey jimmy i know you asked for the supra a little while back we finally got it do you want a chance and i was like yes <laughs> <laughs> what kind of question is that who would turn <laughs> absolutely that down? um so yeah okay so First of all, we all know that the Supra is BMW based and we all, you know, some people, not all, some people absolutely hate that. They say Toyota could have built a better Supra themselves. They have the engineering and they have the money for it. While they do have the money, I don't think they have the engineering for it because in my opinion, if they were to make a Lexus or sorry, a Supra by themselves, it'll be a Lexus RC and that's it. That's terrible. <laughs> like that, that would thing be their drives super. like a boat. Well, but that's what they would do, right? They yeah. don't have a rear drive platform. What are they going to take from? They're not going to build a brand new platform for one car, for a Halo car. No, they're not going to do that. the The whole Toyota thing is going electrification, right? That's why they're spending so much money on hybrid technology. This car, yes, it's a fantastic sports car. And it's a fantastic name with a great heritage, but they don't care about that. You know, Toyota is a company, they're moving forward with hybrid tech. This is not what's going to take them there. So they're not going to put that kind of money. So they're going to use the RC, 100%. And if they don't use the RC, so if they build a brand new platform, uh, you know, their own inline six, it's going to cost them a lot of money making the Supra like 100 Hundred fifty thousand dollar car, yeah. which then no one will buy. That they won't get back because the inline six doesn't make sense for the volume sellers. You cannot shove no. the inline six into a Camry, even or a Highlander, or whatever Anywhere. you want. To. Yeah, it's, it's it will useless not for them. Yeah, it literally and... is useless for them. So th it it won't work for them. Like so, financially, I get why they partnered up with BMW. And if you're going to be building a sports car, I mean, 
BMW is probably one of the better brands. If it's not Porsche, it's yeah. not Lamborghini, it's not actually maybe not even Lamborghini, let's be honest. But yeah. maybe if not Porsche, it's going to be BMW. Yeah. And this car, it drives great, it makes the right sounds. I have no complaints about the driving aspect of it. It's just I feel like they got short end of the stick here um in in the Toyota side. So the Supra, as we know, is very similar to the Z4. Uh, but there's a lot of points on the interior that isn't Z4. It's the older generation BMW. So the steering wheel is like the E90 steering wheel, actually. Actually, maybe newer than that. But it's the regular BMW steering wheel, not the M Sport one. So you get the thicker spokes on the side. The iDrive controller, it's also the previous generation iDrive controller, not the current generation iDrive controller. So there's a, a few things that's in here that it's, it just feel like BMW didn't get everything out yeah. of the out of the the BMW Toyota. Kind yeah, of, no, the steering no, wheel is kind of ugly. Like it's it's not even the the M Sport style. Like it's no. it's very chunky. Uh, I think the steering wheel. The, the, you have to look at it, and that's the that's the problem with it. Is uh, yeah. everything else about this interior works, and I think like I mentioned before, it will age reasonably well compared yeah. to its its counterparts um i still like this car overall a lot more than the z4 like the z4 doesn't do anything for me um but i think if you're looking for that spiritual successor to the z4 m coupe that we had in the 2000s i think this is it yeah right like this is the same shape it's got the same layout uh I guess the big elephant in the room is the automatic. It's fine. It's fine. I mean, with with this much power, almost 400 horse, it's fine to have an automatic. It really is. Like, sure, it's not as enjoyable as rolling through the gears. But, you know, if you're rolling through, like if it's going to be like a GT4 gearbox, you're rolling through first to second and back down to first. Is that really that much more fun? It's right? really like, not, and I, I try to educate a lot of people just because I have a decade of track experience under my belt now. And the thing is, manual driving, I still think is for posers. Because if you're focused on track driving, you're looking at, your, your main focus is lines and throttle and brake application. It's not shifting. Shifting is is so second nature. Like it, you do it just like you do on the street. It, you just do it without thinking about it. But mm-hmm. having less or not having to move your hands from the wheel, I think that engages you so much more with the steering, and that's what really matters when we're talking about real performance driving. Mm-hmm. And I think it lets you focus on doing one less thing, and it does from from a performance perspective and making you a better driver i think it's it is important and that's kind of why i'm leaning towards an automatic track car now there are some automatics out there that have just built a terrible reputation for automatics like not even terrible gearboxes in their own right like like an frs the automatic gearbox is not terrible but i just wouldn't choose that to be my track vehicle uh same with the miata but when you get up to this level, the automatic gearboxes are so good. And I think a lot of people are still stuck in that mindset because, Mm -hmm. you know, back when we were young, we were driving cars that were 10 years old at the time. That's what we were tracking, right? We 10, if not 20 years old. And if we're looking at 20 year old automatic technology from 10 years ago, like a 30 year old Integra four speed over. Exactly. You couldn't even consider, you couldn't even consider tracking that automatic. So, you know, if you carry that mentality with you into 2021, you're just going to have a bad time, I feel like. And yeah. the manual is going to give you, it's going to give you more headache. It's a its a handful, literally, um, to deal with on track. And I just, I, I am personally sick of it. Like, I am, I am ready to just automate my whole fleet. <laughs> <laughs> You know, even though okay, so to be fair, the 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 manuals that that do the rev matching, the I have it on the uh, I had it on the Camaro, I had it on the uh, 
that some of the Porsches do it. The, the M2 does it, but only if you leave stability control on. But why would you? So I still have to heel toe in that. It's like I know how to drive it, but I wish I didn't have to. Like that's that's kind of where I I stand with automatics. Now, the other thing about the automatic gearbox is oh they they're not doing the MDCT on this one. It's just the regular ZF eight speed. Yep. Now I did drive the. Um, the new uh, M3 recently, and I think that new gearbox it just works so much better. And with the MDCT to get it to shift fast, it was quite aggressive and jerky. Uh, and some people like that for you know whatever positive feel per se, but it does upset your car more so than the torque converters do. Mm-hmm. And driving the M3, it's just like. It's so smooth and it's so fast. And it just, like the the gearbox is just not an afterthought. That's the wrong word to describe it. But the fact that you don't have to think about it, it, it's a big plus, I feel like. Um, And it's basically, it's a similar gearbox as to what's in the M3. And look at the, look at the track records this thing is setting. The Supra, um, it's very, uh unassuming i would say the numbers don't tell the full picture and i think i think the numbers is where a lot of the the online car community uh is hung up on because they're like well 300 and what 380 horsepower i think it's not a lot of power uh and especially when they launched the 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 a90 it was like rated at 330 even though yeah. realistically it was a lot more uh it's like 335 i think it was yeah and people were like well that's what i got out of the uh the 2jz <laughs> stock um but no that first off that's peak peak numbers <laughs> you don't have turbo lag <laughs> in this like you do on a 2jz uh second of all the numbers don't don't tell you the full picture this car is not super light it's not super powerful but you look at the lap times, and these are hanging with the GT3s, like GT4, GT level Porsche. And I think you go to any track, and these are putting really respectable numbers down with very little having to do with, like, you don't have to change too much about it mm-hmm. to make it work. And I think the automatics help with that. And just overall, this, this is so compelling because. People don't assume that it can do that much because, yeah, like obviously Mustang GT, like these cars are going to be fast, but the Supra um, being almost 70,000, I think that's what, you know, a lot of the younger guys are like, well, I'm paying how much for 300 and something horsepower? Like, damn, you know, I I can chip a uh, Q60 Red Sport or, you know, whatever. It's like you sure go do that but i will run i will lap you if you <laughs> if you try to take a q60 red sport and it will probably break down before q60 red sport is actually the same price anyways <laughs> yeah yeah realistically the used one maybe not so much but yeah like in terms of dollar for horsepower um it's it's not it doesn't look like a great value um but i think i think you really have to drive the supra to understand it and just packaging wise, it is so small. Like, um, it's it, kind it is of a very compact vehicle. Yeah, like, and you know, I, I I see you have the M2 in the background there. M2, obviously, <laughs> a car I'm very familiar with, but the M2, it's a sedan turned into a sports car. This is from the ground up, a development of a sports car, and you you can drive that difference on track or on the street you can tell okay this is a purpose-built vehicle this one is based off of a, a three series that we've shortened a little bit here widened a little bit here mm-hmm. and yeah so the the m2 is is great it's still fun but the engineering behind the supra is just what kind of blows you away and you really have to to dig deeper to appreciate it. And I think this is going to be the, one of those future classics that, um, and it's it's such a great partnership. I don't know why people think they're so clever when they, oh, that's a BMW. Like, I don't know why 
you have to make that comment. Like, <laughs> why you think you're smart? Why you think you're funny? Why does it even matter? <laughs> you're not smart. You're not funny. Like, if just because you you call it a BMW, like, okay, it's a BMW. Okay, great. Uh, Move yeah. on. <laughs> okay. Um, here's here's one thing that I thought of when I had it. Um, as a person that doesn't track, right? I don't I don't track my cars. I like to drive the cars on the street. Um, and the last few times I had a chance to almost go to the track, I had some car problems and I wasn't able to do that. Um, so that's my excuse, but hopefully it may be in the future. I can, uh, I can go Take back your CRV. My, yeah. With my CRV, <laughs> I'm going to put some, uh, Michelin pilot super sports on there and just flip it. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, on the street, you know, for me, the the Supra with the three liter, I, I'm not saying it's too much power. Not saying that. <laughs> All right. I'm not saying that. But I haven't got a chance to drive the two liter yet. But I look at the numbers from the two liter. The numbers from the two liter, it makes a lot of sense for those who are driving it just daily on the street. Yeah. Sure, it doesn't make the, you know, it doesn't make a huge amount of power, but it still has the same chassis, same uh, tires. You're going to have basically a very similar experience. The suspension is a little different. It's not valved um, the same, and you don't have a limited slip diff in the back, I believe. Oh, I think you do. It's just not an ELSD. Mm, okay. Yeah. So it's a mechanical limited slip. Yeah, something like okay. that. Yeah. But a, a two-liter Supra, let's call it the Silica right because you know back silica then, supra the silica supra i think for people that's just driving it on the street yeah a two liter supra it, it makes good sense and the two liter supra has good torque and it's yes. broad torque too yeah and you know having driven the bmws that have that engine that engine is awesome like yeah. the two the two liter so for me, I would never consider the two liter just because, like, to me, it's like to get this much more performance for for trackable performance for ten grand or whatever it is, like, it's a no brainer. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> I think for for the average Joe and for someone who wants to street it, because when you're streeting car, you don't have to worry about overheating and track reliability quite as much, because to get really reliable hundred horsepower or more is is virtually impossible for ten grand. But driving the the minis and the, the various bmws that have come even a, a really unassuming 330i and you're like this is a lot of power like it just it just hits you and there's no lag it's just effortless the two liter is plenty fast and it's a great frs uh upgrade like if you're just going you know you're taking that next step up from mm -hmm. a gr gr86 um to up to the two liter now it is a lot more than a gr8 yeah i was gonna say <laughs> <laughs> even with the two liter it is a big a, a price two liter jump. is fifty six thousand, whereas a yeah. gre6 is i think it was probably around low 30s like 30 to 40 right yeah, yeah like a good one maybe 40 but it is a pretty big price jump but uh i haven't <laughs> obviously i haven't driven the new gr86 yet it does have a little bit more power but the first thing you notice in that car when you try to have a bit of fun with it the old one at least is that it's a little bit underpowered like it's it's quite obviously underpowered yeah well uh, that's that's where that torque comes in right because the two liter turbo in the supra yeah. has that meaty torque curve right in the center like all bmw it has literally a flat torque curve yeah, between like 1500, 1800, all the way to like 5000, 6000, somewhere around there. Yeah. Like it's flat. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. Old. And it, sounds, it sounds good too. Sounds good too. Yeah. It sounds better than the M3 um, on another note. But yeah, if you had like a, a if this would be like a step up, um, a big step up. And I think, yeah, if you're used to the the num the numbers that the, the the two liter gives you, again, it's it's not an impressive peak number, but real world, I I challenge a lot of people to keep up with that around a circuit, 
even the two liter variant just because mm -hmm. the chassis is so brilliant and if you're if you're modifying it the two liter might be the way to go right like and that's kind of what we saw with the mustang right we saw the the ecoboost and the gt and both take off in their own right and they're both yeah there's about 10 grand in between them if maybe a little bit more depending on which trims you go but it's a similar recipe there but the ecoboost mustang to be fair, is a lot more approachable than the two liter Supra again. But I, I get it because this is really purpose built car. The engineering is going to cost a lot because of how low volume this car is. It's not going to be, you don't have rental fleets, rental fleets uh, paying down your, your engineering with the Supras. Mm -hmm. um, but it is that same thing where maybe this will attract more of a tuner crowd going with the two liter variant. Um, and then the, the, the six cylinder is going to be that uh, you just want to leave it uh, as unmolested as possible. Um, but I can totally I, see two liter. People are going to build two liters for five grand that will beat the, the six cylinders. I, I just want to clarify if you're buying a Supra, don't buy the two liter. The resale on the two liter is not going to be anywhere near as close as a three liter. Um, I just want to let you guys know that because inevitably, like the two liter isn't going to have a good resale value. Yeah. Uh, the three liter probably is going to be a lot better. But if you're, you know, if you're the type of guy that want or girl, of course, you know, uh, it's 2021, not only guys <laughs> buy Supras. Anyways, what, you know, whom, whomever you may be, if you're buying a Supra um, and you want to just enjoy it, you want to experience it, you want to have everyday livability out of it, that $56,000 two liter, 255 horse, 295 pound feet of torque, it's more than enough for you to have fun. Yeah, that's, that's what a I'm lot trying to say. Torque. That's what that I'm trying to say. Lot. And, and you know what? Look at it from a BMW perspective. Then it starts to make sense. You compare it to a 430i or even a 230i, whatever, whenever that new one is coming. It's going to be similarly priced. Yeah. If you don't need the back seat and the trunk, because the, the two series trunk is quite substantial. Uh, and this Catch one is, is a little not, bit more useful on the Supra, though. It's it's really not no? <laughs> because of the subwoofer. <laughs> it's like if you want to put like a large suitcase in it. Yeah. The two series is is way better. A little bit better. <laughs> um, <laughs> and what if so, I got a long piece so of narrow. lumber I need to put in? Supra is better for that. If you need to put trapezoidal <laughs> pieces of, of storage, whatever it might be, uh, then the, the Supra may work out better. But yeah, the the 2 Series is a more livable car, but I think this chassis is is something really special. And it's something that it's kind of a, the last of its kind. Mm -hmm. It's just a dedicated two-seater sports car obviously yeah. gr86 i'm um, not to discount that car at all but that car is an evolution of something that came 10 years ago uh this is this is from the ground up and and just a full re-engineering or, or full new engineer uh chassis it's a it's a different experience between this and the gr86 i mean i mm -hmm. have obviously haven't sat in the gr86 but this feels like a proper luxury car sitting inside it i mean it, yeah. it substantially weighs more as well i mean this weighs almost a thousand pounds more mm -hmm. no 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 you, about 500 right. pounds about 500 pounds more um, okay oh it's like oh yeah it's 30 this is 3200 pounds the grd6 weighs in at 2800 pounds okay so, so yeah. not that much more but the sound deadening just the overall feel because it is a bmw the interior is like it's so solid like the the yeah. dashboard is is one solid hunk you know whereas like the you, you sit in an fr80 <laughs> fr86 whatever you call it call it these days it, it's the same thing as a 20 year old corolla right you have the same clock from you know 30 years ago i know it doesn't feel great the plastics in there are not Man. great but you're not buying a gr86 because it feels great that's a more let's yes. say connected type of car whereas a grd6 at least you have power and luxury you get the two in gr supra yeah uh as oh. far as like living with this on a day, -day you don't feel like you're driving something cheap yeah. um 
having I don't like driving the FRS because it does feel like when I turn the climate knob on that thing, clack clack clack. <laughs> it's just like the just like or, the annex, the old door handles, sound effects. <laughs> this is a sound effects episode <laughs> of kicking tires. But um, the climate on this car is on the Supra is a lot more elegant than yeah. uh, even even it looks like the new the new eight uh, six. This is this is a lot more premium feeling and yeah. yeah, there's there's something to be said there. All right, I think that's about it. Anything else you want to go over? Mm, I'm gonna do my own little test drive of the Supra, more in depth test drive next week. <laughs> Ooh, sounds good. Yeah. All right. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you so much for uh, watching or listening in. We'll catch you next week for more apparently super news, but whatever else is, uh, whatever else is uh, coming on the news and pipeline there. Take care, everyone. You're not going to say bye. No. (laughs) Now you have to to trim it out. (laughs) I'm not going to trim it. No. (laughs) 